This is BBC Radio 3. It's some years since the great English theatre director Peter Hall first staged Peter Schaffer's Amadeus at the National Theatre. From there, the play stormed into the West End and in America, into Broadway and Hollywood. The BBC broadcast Amadeus on the radio with the National Theatre cast in 1983, and that's the version we're going to hear in a few minutes' time. Before that, though, we recently caught up with Sir Peter Hall and asked him to reflect on the huge success of Amadeus. Peter Schaffer and Amadeus go together in the most extraordinary way, I think, as a mid-20th century drama still being performed all over the world. Yet it's demanding. It demands thought and it demands a real sincere reaction to the music. Because Peter is such a popular writer, people of course love to denigrate and say it's populism. Yes it is, but it's very, very well crafted populism and very, very beautifully done. He said he wanted me to direct it. Now, even if you're running the National Theatre, you can't really refuse to, to direct Peter Schaffer's play if it is, as it proved to be, absolutely wonderful. Well, I knew my Mozart pretty well before this, the great script arrived. I mean, during that period, I'd, I'd done The Magic Flute, Marriage of Figaro, Così fan tutte, Don Giovanni, many times. That seemed to be part of the same world. One of the great benefits of working at the National Theatre is that you have space and time to do the job. You're not cut short with a very, very short rehearsal period. You're allowed to let it bloom. I think even our first Amadeus ever bloomed. I'll never forget the first night. The audience went wild. There is a, a lot of almost knockabout comedy in it, which needs searching out, playing and enjoying. Um, there's quite a lot of almost melodrama in it, which needs honouring. He took the whole spectrum of theatre as it stood at that moment, uh, the leading actor narrating directly to the audience, the romantic lead, Mozart, crawling around under the piano and making dirty jokes. If you tell people about Amadeus and they haven't seen it, you can see those who are frightened and those who are not. It's truth that frightens them. There was, of course, a lot of anger from uh, people who said that Mozart couldn't have been like that. Indeed, um, Margaret Thatcher said it to me. It's quite rare for uh, MPs to come to the theatre because they're always busy, they say, in the evenings. She was persuaded to come and see Amadeus. At the end, there was a short dinner in the uh, cafe at the, at the restaurant where Margaret Thatcher and the secretary to the cabinet discussed the play with uh, the workers, which was me and my lot. And uh, Margaret Thatcher, I remember, said to me, I do think you've done a dreadful thing by putting on this play. It's so filthy. I said, what's filthy about it? She said, well, those jokes he tells his father by letter. And I said, but Mozart had an extremely dirty mind. Indeed, it's something he shared with his father. Part of his glee in life, Mozart's glee. But the Prime Minister would have none of it. She said he couldn't possibly have written such beautiful music and said such dreadful things. They didn't go together. I'll let you into a secret uh, about the music. All the stuff which Peter Schaffer and I selected was slightly doctored by Harrison Birtwistle so that it was as if someone had copied a picture slightly out of it. Of course, the whole play is a memory play and the narration by Salieri is as an old man doing his last will and testament, practically. I asked Harry if he could give some perspective which wasn't Mozart. I mean, deliberately. We were very, very careful about it, but what was pleasurable was that it worked dramatically, as you'll hear, but it didn't draw attention to itself. <laughs> The thing I remember about the recording for radio is that it was the theatre's response to sound and the sound to the theatres. It was like a rather splendid cricket team being let out 
to bat and ball and I hadn't done it for a few days and they were so glad to let it happen again. We shot, I use film parlance, but we shot Amadeus in little chunks, some of them only lasting for five, seven, ten minutes. But it was edited and put together as a piece of film and as a consequence it was able to deliver something which was quite tight, quite disciplined, not sentimental and fast. I think too much radio is too slow. And I think in everybody's mind was, this will last, because it, it does last. I was staggered listening to it this weekend, what Schaffer had done, because uh, without the word, there is no theatre, in my view. And it was extraordinary how he did that. Sir Peter Hall. And so, to tonight's Drama on Three, Sir Peter Hall's production of Peter Schaffer's play Amadeus, first broadcast in 1983 and recorded with the original National Theatre cast. We're repeating it now as part of Radio 3's Genius of Mozart season. The play combines fiction and history to detail Mozart's final years, at a time when Antonio Salieri, an older composer propelled by jealousy, appears to plot the tragic downfall of his brilliant rival. With Paul Schofield as Antonio Salieri and Simon Callow as Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Salieri? They say. I hear. I hear. They say. I don't believe it. Salieri? The whole city is talking. You hear it all over. The cafes. The opera. Prater. The gutter. They say even Metternich repeats it. They say even Beethoven is old pupil. But why now? After so long. 32 years? I don't believe it. Salieri? They say he shouts it out all day. I hear he cries it out all night. Stays in his apartment. Never goes out. Not for a year now. Longer, longer. Must be 70? Older, older. Antonio Salieri. A famous musician. Shouting it aloud. Crying it aloud. Impossible. Incredible. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Salieri? I know who started the tale. I know who started the tale. The old man's valet. Here. The old man's cook. Here. The valet hears him shouting. The cook hears him crying. What a story. What a scandal. What does he say, your master? What does he cry, the Kapellmeister? Alone in his house? All day and all night. What sins does he shout? The old fellow a recluse? What horrors have you heard? Tell us. Tell us. Tell, tell us, us at once. once. What, what does he cry? cry? What does he cry? What does he cry? Mozart? Mozart? Perdonami, Mozart! Il tuo assassino ti chiedi perdono! Pardon, Mozart? Pardon your assassin? God, God preserve us! Pietà! Mozart! Mozart! Pietà! Mercy, Mozart! Mozart have mercy! He speaks in Italian when excited. German when not. Perdona me, Mozart. Pardon your assassin. There was talk once before, you know. Thirty-two years ago. When Mozart was dying. He claimed he'd been poisoned. Some said he accused a man. Some said that man was Salieri. But no one believed it. They knew what he died of. Syphilis, surely. Like everybody else. But what if Mozart was right? If he really was murdered. And by him, our first Kapellmeister? Antonio Salieri. It can't possibly be true. It's not actually credible. Because why? Because why? Why, why on earth, earth would he do it? And why confess now? After 32 years. Salieri. Mozart. Mozart, perdonami. Il tuo assassino ti chiedi perdono. What do you think? What do you think? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. All the same. Is it just possible? Did he do it after all? Vi saluto, ombre del futuro, Antonio Salieri a vostro servizio. I can almost see you in your ranks. 
waiting for your turn to live. Ghosts of the future. Be visible. I beg you, be visible. Come to this dusty old room this time, the smallest hours of dark November, 1823, and be my confessors. Will you not enter this place and stay with me till dawn? Just till dawn, until six o'clock. Can you hear them? Vienna is a city of slander. Everyone tells tales here, even my servants. I keep only two now. They've been with me ever since I came here 50 years ago. The keeper of the razor. Sir. The maker of the cakes. Sir. One keeps me tidy, the other keeps me full. Leave me, both of you. Tonight, I do not go to bed at all. Return here tomorrow, six precisely, to shave, to feed your capricious master. Via. Via, via, via. Grazie. How surprised they are. They'll be even more surprised tomorrow. Indeed, they will. Oh, won't you appear? I need you desperately. Those about to die implore you. What must I do to make you visible? Raise you up in the flesh to be my last, last audience. Does it take an invocation? That's how it's always done in opera. Oh, yes, of course, that's it. An invocation, the only way. Let me try to conjure you now. Ghosts of the distant future, so I can see you. Ghosts of the future. Shades of time to come. So much more unavoidable than those of time gone by. Appear with what sympathy incarnation may endow you. Appear you, the yet to be born, the yet to hate, the yet to kill. Appear posterity. There, it worked. I can see you sitting there listening. That's a result of proper training. I was taught invocation by Chevalier Gluck, who was a true master at it. He had to be. In his day, that's what people went to the opera for, the raising of gods and ghosts. Nowadays, since Rossini became the rage, they prefer to watch the antics of hairdressers. Scusate. Invocation's an exhausting business. I need refreshment. It's a little repellent, I admit, but actually the first sin I have to confess to you is gluttony. Sticky gluttony at that. Infantine Italian gluttony. The truth is that all my life I've never been able to conquer a lust for the sweet meats of northern Italy where I was born. From the ages of three to seventy-three, my entire career has been conducted to the taste of almonds sprinkled with sifted sugar. Milanese biscuits, Siena macaroons, snow dumplings with pistachio sauce. Do not judge me too harshly for this. All men harbour patriotic feelings of some kind. My parents were Italian subjects of the Austrian Empire, a Lombardy merchant and his Lombardy wife. Their notion of place was the tiny town of Legnago, which I couldn't wait to leave. Their notion of God was a superior Habsburg emperor inhabiting a heaven only slightly further off than Vienna. All they asked of him was to keep them forever unnoticed, preserved in mediocrity. My own requirements were somewhat different. I wanted fame, not to deceive you, 
I wanted to blaze like a comet across the firmament of Europe, yet only in one especial way. Music. Absolute music. A note of music is either right or wrong. Absolutely. Not even time can alter that. Music is God's art. Already when I was ten, a spray of sounded notes could make me dizzy almost to falling. By twelve, I was stumbling around the countryside humming my arias and anthems to the Lord. My one desire was to join all the composers who had celebrated God's glory through the long Italian past. Every Sunday, I saw him in church, painted on the flaking wall. I don't mean Christ. The Christs of Lombardy are simpering sillies with lambkins on their sleeves. No, I mean an old candle-smoked god in a mulberry robe, staring at the world with dealer's eyes. Tradesmen had put him up there. Those eyes made bargains, real and irreversible. You give me so, I'll give you so. No more, no less. One day, <laughs> I went to see him. I made a bargain with him myself. I was a sober sixteen, filled with a desperate sense of right. I knelt before the God of bargains, and I prayed with all my soul, Signore, let me be a composer. Grant me sufficient fame to enjoy it. In return, I will live with virtue. I will be chaste. I will strive to better the lot of my fellows, and I will honour you with much music all the days of my life. As I said, Amen, I saw his eyes flare. Bene. Go forth, Antonio. Serve me and mankind, and you will be blessed. Grazie, I called back. I am your servant for life. The very next day, a family friend suddenly appeared out of the blue, took me off to Vienna and paid for me to study music. Shortly afterwards, I met the Emperor of Austria, who favoured me. Clearly, my bargain had been accepted. The same year, I left Italy. A young prodigy was touring Europe. A miraculous virtuoso, aged ten years. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And now, gracious ladies, obliging gentlemen, May I present to you, for one performance only, my last composition entitled The Death of Mozart, or Did I Do It? Dedicated to posterity on this, the last night of my life. The place throughout is Vienna. The year, to begin with, 1781. The age, still that of the Enlightenment, that clear time before the guillotine fell in France and cut all our lives in half. I am 31, already a prolific composer at the Habsburg Court. I own a respectable house and a respectable wife, Teresa. I do not mock her, I assure you. I required only one quality in a domestic companion, lack of fire. And in that omission, Teresa was conspicuous. I also had a prize pupil, Caterina Cavalieri. She was a bubbling student with merry eyes and a sweet, eatable mouth. I was very much in love with Caterina, or at least in lust. Because of my vow to God, I'd never laid a finger upon the girl. 
except occasionally to depress her diaphragm in the way of teaching her to sing. My ambition burned with an unquenchable flame. Its chief goal was the post of first royal Kapellmeister, then held by Giuseppe Bono, 70 years old and apparently immortal. You, when you come, will be told that we musicians of the 18th century were no better than servants, the willing slaves of the well-to-do. This is quite true. It is also quite false. Yes, we were servants, but we were learned servants, and we used our learning to celebrate men's average lives. We took unremarkable men, usual bankers, run-of-the-mill priests, ordinary soldiers, statesmen and wives, and sacramentalized their mediocrity. We smoothed their noons with strings divisi. We pierced their nights with chitarini. We gave them processions for their strutting, serenades for their rutting, high horns for their hunting, and drums for their wars. Trumpets sounded when they entered the world, and trombones groaned when they left it. The savor of their days remains behind because of us. Our music still remembered, while their politics are long forgotten. Tell me, before you call us servants, who served whom, and who, I wonder, in your generations will immortalize you? Sir, 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 sir. I was the most successful young musician in the city of musicians, when suddenly, without warning... Mozart! Mozart! Mozart, Mozart has come! These are my venticelli, my little winds, as I called them. Sir. Sir. The secret of successful living in a large city is always to know to the minute what is being done behind your back. He's left Salzburg. He means to give concerts. Asking for subscribers. I'd known of him for years, of course. Tales of his prowess were told all over Europe. They say he wrote his first symphony at five. I hear his first concerto at four. A full opera at fourteen. Mitridati, King of Pontus. How old is he now? Twenty-five. And how long is he remaining? He's not departing. He's here to stay. You are required to commission a comic opera in German from Herr Mozart. Johann von Strack, Royal Chamberlain, a court official to his collarbone. Why in German? Italian is the only possible language for opera. Count Franz Orsini Rosenberg, director of the opera benevolent to all things Italian, including myself. The idea of a national opera is dear to His Majesty's heart. He desires to hear pieces in good, plain German. Yes, but why comic? It is not the function of music to be funny. Baron van Schweten, Prefect of the Imperial Library, ardent Freemason, yet to find anything funny. Known for his enthusiasm for old-fashioned music as Lord Few. I heard last week a remarkable serious opera from Mozart, a Domineo, King of Crete. I heard that too. A young fellow trying to impress beyond his abilities. Too much spice, too many notes. Nevertheless, kindly convey the commission to him today. I believe we're going to have trouble with this young man. He was a child prodigy. That always spells trouble. His father is Leopold Mozart, a pedantic Salzburg musician in the service of the Archbishop, who dragged the boy endlessly round Europe, making him play the keyboard blindfold with one finger, that sort of thing. All prodigies are hateful. Non è vero, signor Salieri. Divengano sempre sterili con gli anni. <laughs> Precisamente, precisamente. What do you say? Nothing, Herr Chamberlain. Niente, Signor Pomposo. We meet tomorrow, I believe, on your committee to devise pensions for old musicians. It is most gracious of you to attend, Baron. You're a worthy man, Salieri. You should join our Brotherhood of Masons. We would welcome you warmly. I would be honored, Baron. If you wish, I could arrange initiation into my lodge. That would be more than my due. Nonsense, we embrace men of talent, of all conditions. I may invite young Mozart also, dependent on the impression he makes. Of course, Baron. Honor, indeed. In those days, almost every man of influence in Vienna was a mason. And the Baron's Lodge, by far, the most fashionable. As for young Mozart, I confess I was alarmed by his coming. He was praised altogether too much. 
Such gaiety of spirit. Such ease of manner. Such natural charm. Really? Where does he live? Pater Platz. Number 11. Uh, the landlady is Madame Weber. A real bitch. Takes in male lodgers and has a tribe of daughters. Uh, Mozart was engaged to one of them before. A soprano called Aloysia. She jilted him. Now he's after another sister. Constanza. I mean, he was actually engaged to one sister and now wants to marry another. Exactly. exactly. Her mother's pushing it. His father isn't. Daddy's worried sick. Writes him every day from Salzburg. I want to meet him. He'll be at the Baroness Valstaten's tomorrow night. Grazie. Uh, some of his music is to be played. Restiamo in contatto. Certamente, signore. So to the Baroness Valstaten's I went. That night changed my life. I entered the library to take first a little refreshment. My generous hostess always put out the most delicious confections in that room whenever she knew I was coming. Sorbetti. Caramelli, and most especially a miraculous crema al mascarpone, which is simply cream cheese mixed with granulated sugar and suffused with rum, which is totally irresistible. I just sat down in a high back chair to consume this paradisal dish, unobservable as it happened to anyone who might come in. Before I could rise, it had become difficult to do so. I'm going to bite you in half with my fangs, wangs, my little stancil, bouncil, bouncil. <laughs> you're trembling. I think you're frightened, of course, Willis. I think you're scared to death. I think you're going to shit yourself. <laughs> in a moment, it's going to be on the floor. Someone near you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> nasty and smelly on the floor. Here he comes. I can hear it coming. Don't be that stupid. Oh, what a melancholy note. Something's <laughs> dropping from your boat. Oh. Now that's stupid. That's really stupid. <laughs> hey, hey, what's Trazom? What? T-R-A-Z-O-M. What's that mean? <laughs> How should I know? It's Mozart spelt backward. <laughs> Shit, we... Ah! If you married me, you'd be Constanza Trazom. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> yes, you would. Because I'd want everything backwards once I was married. I wouldn't lick my wife's ass instead of her face. Oh, you're not going to lick anything at this rate. Your father's never going to give his consent. Who cares about his consent? You do. You care very much. You wouldn't do it without. Wouldn't no, I? you wouldn't, because you're too scared of him. I know what he says about me. If you marry that dreadful girl, you're going to end up lying on straw with beggars for children. Marry me. Don't be stupid. Marry me. Are you serious? Yes. Answer this minute. Yes or no? Say yes, and I can go home, climb to bed, shit over the mattress and shout, I did it! Ah! <laughs> Her ladyship is ready to commence. Oh, yes, good. Ah. Come, my dear, the music waits. Oh, by all means, Herr Trotzol. <laughs> and then right away the concert began. I heard it through the door, some serenade, only vaguely at first, too horrified to attend. But presently the sound insisted. A solemn adagio in E-flat. It started simply enough. Just a pulse in the lowest register. Bassoons and basset horns like a rusty squeeze box. It would have been comic except for the slowness which gave it instead a sort of serenity. And then suddenly sounded a single note on an oboe. It hung there, unwavering, piercing me through, till breath could hold it no longer, and a clarinet withdrew it out of me, and softened it and sweetened it to a phrase of such delight it had me trembling. The light flickered in the room. My eyes clouded. The squeeze box groaned louder, and over it the higher instruments 
wailed and warbled, throwing lines of sound around me. Long lines of pain around and through me. Ah, the pain. Pain as I had never known it. I called up to my sharp old god. What is this? What? But the squeeze box went on and on and the pain cut deeper into my shaking head until suddenly I was running, dashing through the side door, stumbling down into the street, into the cold night, gasping for life. What? What is this? Tell me, signore. What is this pain? What is this need in the sound? Forever unfulfillable, and yet fulfilling him who hears it utterly. Is it your need? Can it be yours? Dimly the music sounded from the salon above. Dimly the stars shot on the empty street. I was suddenly frightened. It seemed to me that I had heard a voice of God and that it issued from a creature whose voice I had also heard and it was the voice of an obscene child. I ran home, buried my fear in work. More pupils till there were 30 and 40. More committees toiling long hours to help musicians. More motets and anthems to God's glory. And at night I prayed for just one thing. Let your voice enter me. Let me be your conduct. Let me. As for Mozart, I avoided meeting him and sent out my little winds for whatever scores of his might be found. Six forty piano sonatas composed in Munich. Clever. Two in Mannheim. They were all clever. A Parisian symphony. And yet they seemed to me completely empty. A divertimento in D. Same. A cassazione in G. Conventional. A grand litany in E flat. Even boring. Productions of a precocious youngster, Leopold Mozart's swanky son, no more. That serenade was obviously an exception in his work, the sort of accident which might visit any composer on a lucky day. Had I, in fact, been simply taken by surprise that the filthy creature could write music at all, suddenly I felt immensely cheered. I would seek him out myself and welcome him to Vienna. Fates and fireworks, gentlemen, Mozart is here. He's waiting below. Majesty. Je suis follement impatient. The Emperor Joseph II of Austria, son of Maria Theresa, brother of Marie Antoinette, a daughter of music, provided it made no demands. Majesty, I have written a little march in Mozart's honor. May I play it as he comes in? By all means, court composer, what a delightful idea. Have you met him yet? Not yet, Majesty. Fates and fireworks, what fun. Strack, bring him up at once. Majesty. Mon Dieu, I wish we could have a competition. Mozart against some other virtuoso. Two keyboards in contest. Wouldn't that be fun, Baron? Not to me, Majesty. In my view, musicians are not horses to be run against one another. Ah. Well, there it is. Well, Mozart, Nancy. Ah, splendid. Court composer. Allons. Admit him, please. <laughs> D'habitude. <laughs> Mozart. Majesty. Your Majesty's humble slave. Let me kiss your royal hand a hundred thousand times. No, 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 no. S'il vous plaît. A little less enthusiasm, I beg you. <laughs> Come, sir. levez vous You will not recall it, but the last time we met, you were also on the floor. My sister remembers it to this day. This young man, all of six years old, mind you, slipped on the floor at Schoenbrunn. Came a nasty perler on his little head. 
Have I told you this before? Uh, no, no. Well, my sister, Antoinette, runs forward and picks him up herself. And do you know what he does? Jumps right into her arms. Whoopla! Just like that. Kisses her on both cheeks and says, Will you marry me, yes or no? <laughs> I did not mean to embarrass you, Herr Mozart. You know everyone here, surely. Yes, sir. Herr Director? Herr Prefect? But not, I think, our esteemed court composer. A most serious omission. No one who cares for art can afford not to know Herr Salieri. He wrote that exquisite little march of welcome for you. It was a trifle, Majesty. Nevertheless. I'm overwhelmed, Signore. Ideas simply pour out of him. Do they not, Strack? Endlessly, sir. Well done, Salieri. Let it be my pleasure to introduce you. Court composer Salieri, Herr Mozart of Salzburg. Ah, finalmente, che gioia, che diletto straordinario. Grazie, signore, mille milioni di benvenuti. Sono commosso e non ho le eccezionali a incontrarla. Composizione brillante, famosissimo. Grazie. Tell me, Mozart, have you received our commission for the opera? Indeed I have, Majesty. I'm so grateful I can hardly speak. I swear to you that you will have the best the most perfect entertainment ever offered a monarch. I've already found a libretto. Uh, have you? I didn't hear of this. Oh, forgive me, Herr Director, I entirely omitted to tell you. May I ask why? Didn't seem very important. Not important? Not really, no. It is important to me, Herr Mozart. Uh, yes, uh, I see that, of course. And whom prays it by? Stefani. A most unpleasant man. But a brilliant writer. Do you think? The story is really amusing, Majesty. The whole plot said in a... <laughs> in a... <laughs> said in a... Uh, where? Where is it set? It's rather saucy, Your Majesty. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Where? Well, it's actually set in a seraglio. <coughs> a what? A Pasha's harem. Don't you imagine that is a suitable subject for performance at a national theatre? Yes. I mean, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I mean, yes, yes, I do. Why not? I mean, it's very funny. It's a music on oh, my honour, Majesty. There's nothing offensive in it. Nothing offensive in the world. It's full of proper German virtues, I swear it. Scusate, signore, but what are those? Being a foreigner, I'm not sure. Oh, you are being cattivo, court composer. Oh, not at all, Majesty. <laughs> Come then, Mozart. Name us a proper German virtue. Love, sir. I've yet to see that expressed in any opera. Well answered, Mozart. I was under the impression one rarely saw anything else expressed in opera. <laughs> <laughs> I mean manly love, signore, not male sopranos screeching or stupid couples rolling their eyes, all that absurd Italian rubbish. <clears throat> I mean, the real thing. And do you know the real thing yourself, Herr Mozart? Under your pardon, I think I do, Your Majesty. <laughs> Bravo. When do you think it will be done? The first act's already finished. But it can't be more than two weeks since you started. Composing's not hard when you have the right audience to please, sire. Charming reply, Majesty. Indeed, Baron. Fates and fireworks. I can see that we're going to have fates and fireworks. Au revoir, Monsieur Mozart. Soyez bienvenue à la cour. Majesty, je suis comblé d'honneur d'être accepté dans la maison du père de tous les musiciens. Servir à Monaco si plein de discernement que votre majesté, c'est un honneur qui dépasse le sommet de mes dues. Ah, well, there it is. I leave you gentlemen to become better acquainted. Good day, Majesty. Votre Majesty. Good day to you. Good day. Welcome, Mozart. I shall see much more of you. Depend on it. Thank you. Bene. Bene. I too wish you success with your opera. I'll have it. It's going to be superb. I must know. I've already found the most excellent soprano for the leading part. Oh, who is that? Her name's Cavalieri. Caterina Cavalieri. She's really German. But she thinks it will advance her career if she sports an Italian oh, name. She's quite right. It was my idea. She is, in fact, my prize pupil. Actually, she's a very innocent child. Silly in the way of young singers, but, you know, she's only 20. Uh, 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 I kept my hands off Caterina. Yes, but I couldn't bear to think of anyone else's upon her, least of all his. You're a good fellow, Salieri. <laughs> and that's a jolly little thing you wrote for me. It was my pleasure. Let's see if I can remember it. May I? By all means, it's yours. Grazie, signore.
less it's just the same, isn't it? You have a remarkable memory. Grazie ancora, signore. Doesn't really work, that fourth, does it? Let's try the third above it. Ah, oh, yes. Good. Go. Really? Why don't you try a variation? Thank you, but I must attend on the Emperor. Oh. It's been delightful to meet you. For me, too. And thanks for the march. Was it then so early that I began to have thoughts of murder? Of course not. At least not in life. In art, it was a different matter. I decided I would compose a huge, tragic opera, something to astonish the world, and I knew my theme. I would set the legend of Danaeus, who for a monstrous crime was chained to a rock for eternity, his head repeatedly struck by lightning. Wickedly, I saw Mozart in that position. In reality, the man was in no danger from me at all. Not yet. The first performance of Seraglio arrived. The creature's expression of manly love. He himself contrived to wear for the occasion an even more vulgar coat than usual. As for the music, it matched the coat completely. For my dear pupil Caterina Cavalieri, he'd written quite simply the showiest aria I had ever heard. Ten minutes of scales and ornaments amounting in sum to a vast emptiness. So ridiculous was the piece. So much what might be demanded by a foolish young soprano that I knew instantly what Mozart must have demanded in return. Although engaged to be married, he had had her. I knew that beyond any doubt. The creature had had my darling girl. May I present my fiancée, Fräulein Weber? Enchanté, Fräulein. Your Majesty. Constanza is a singer herself. Indeed. Oh, I'm not at all, Majesty. Oh, don't be silly, Wolfgang. So, Mozart, a good effort. Decidedly that, a good effort. Did you really like it, sir? I thought it was most interesting. Yes, indeed. Uh, a trifle, uh, how shall one say? How shall one say, director? Too many notes, Majesty. Very well put. Too many notes. I don't understand. Oh, my dear fellow, don't take it too hard. There are, in fact, only so many notes the ear can hear in the course of an evening. I think I'm right in saying that, aren't I, court composer? Well, yes. I would say yes, on the whole. Yes, Majesty. There you are. It's clever, it's German, it's quality work, and there are simply too many notes, do you see? There are just as many notes, Majesty, neither more nor less, as are required. Ah. Well, there it is. Is he angry? Not at all. 
he respects you for your views. I, I, I hope so. What, what did you think yourself, sir? Did you care for the piece at all? Yes, of course, Mozart. At its best, it was truly charming. And at other times? Well, just occasionally at other times. In Katerina's aria, for example, it was a little excessive. Katerina's an excessive girl. In fact, she's insatiable. Uh, all the same as my revered teacher, the Chevalier Gluck, used to say to me, one must avoid music that smells of music. What does that mean? Music which makes one aware too much of the virtuosity of the composer. Gluck is absurd. What do you say? <laughs> He's talked all his life about modernising opera. Then creates people so lofty they sound like they shit marble. Oh, oh, excuse now, me. Now, no, it's too much. Gluck says, Gluck says, Chevalier Gluck. What is, what's Chevalier? I'm a Chevalier. The Pope made me a Chevalier when I was still wetting my bed. Lotho. Anyway, it's ridiculous. Only stupid fart sport titles. Uh, such as Court Composer. What? Ah. Oh. oh. Ha-ha. <laughs> well, my father's right again. He always tells me I should padlock my mouth. Actually, I shouldn't speak at all. Nonsense. I was just being what the emperor would call cattivo. Won't you introduce me to your charming fiancé? Of course, C Constanza. This is court composer Salieri, Fräulein Weber. Delighted, cara Fräulein. I do, you do, Excellency. You're the sister of Aloysia Weber, the soprano, are you not? I am, Excellency. A beauty herself, but you exceed her by far, if I may observe. So. Oh, thank you. May I ask when you marry? Oh, we have to secure my father's consent. <laughs> He's an excellent man, a wonderful man, but in some ways a little stubborn. Uh, excuse me, but how old are you? Twenty-six. Then your father's consent is scarcely indispensable. You see? Well, no, it's not indispensable no of course not my advice to you is marry and be happy you have found it is quite obvious un tesoro raro oh, very much good night to you both good night excellency good night and thank you as i watched her walk away on the arm of the creature i felt the lightning thought strike have her her for Katerina. Abomination. Never in my life had I entertained a notion so sinful. <laughs> <laughs> They're married! What? Mozart and Weber, married! Really? His father will be furious. They didn't even wait for his consent. Have they set up house? Wepplingerstrasse. Number 12. Not bad. Considering they've no money. Is that really true? Oh, he's wildly extravagant. Lives way beyond his means. But he has pupils. <laughs> Only three. <laughs> Why so few? He's embarrassing. Makes scenes. Makes enemies. Even Strack, whom he cultivates. Uh, Chamberlain Strack. Only last night. At Kapellmeister Bono's. <laughs> Seven months in this city and not one job. I'm not to be tried again, is that it? Of course it isn't. I know what goes on and so do you. Vienna's completely in the hands of foreigners. Oh. Worthless what? Oh. Like Kapellmeister Bono. Please, you're in the man's house. Poor composer Salieri. Did you see his last opera, The Chimney Sweep? Of course I did. Dog shit. Oh. Dry dog oh. shit. I <laughs> beg your pardon. Pom, 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 pom. Tonic and dominant, tonic and dominant. From here to resurrection, not one interesting modulation all night. Salieri is a musical idiot. Please. He's had too much to drink. He often has. <laughs> Why are Italians so terrified by the slightest complexity of music? Show them one chromatic passage and they faint. Oh, how sick. Oh, how morbid. Morboso, nervoso. Oh, me. No wonder music at this court is so dreary. Lower your voice. Lower your britches! <laughs> oh, is it just a joke? Just a joke? Ah, oh, Herr Mozart. You look like a toad. <laughs> You're goggling like a toad. You would do best to retire tonight for your own sake. Salieri has 50 pupils. I have three. How am I to live? I'm a married man now. Well, of course, I realise you don't concern yourself with money in these exalted circles. All the same, did you know behind his back, his majesty is known as Kaiser Keep It? Oh, oh, oh. It. oh I shouldn't have said that, should I? Uh, forgive me, oh, it's, just, it's just a joke. It's another joke. I can't help myself. Huh? We're all friends here, aren't we? Mm, good night. What's wrong with him? Good night. No, no, no. 
Uh, please, please. Your hand, please. First, give me a post, sir. That is not in my power, Mozart. The Princess Elizabeth is looking for an instructor. One word from you could secure it for me. I regret. That is solely in the recommendation of court composer Salieri. You know I'm better than any musician in Vienna. Do you? Better? Foppy wops. I'm sick of that. Foppy wops. Foppy. Poppy. <coughs> Snobby. Foppy. Poppy. Barely one month later, the thought of revenge became more than thought. <gasps> forfeit, forfeit! Forfeit, Stanzel, you've got to forfeit! I won't! You have to! It's the game! I was once again, believe it or not, in the same concealing chair in the Baroness's library, consuming the same delicious dessert. You <laughs> lost, and now there's the penalty. A party celebrating New Year's Eve. I was on my own, my dear wife visiting her parents in Italy. Well, what? What is it? <laughs> I want to measure your calves. <gasps> oh! Well? Definitely not, you cheeky bugger. Now, come on. You've got to let him stand still. All's fair in love and forfeit. No, it isn't, so you can both buzz off. If you don't let me, you won't be allowed to play again. Well, choose something else. I've chosen that. Now, up on that table, quick, oh. 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 oh, oh, well. <laughs> quick, then, before anyone sees. Hold her free. No, I don't need to be held, thank you. Oh, yes, you do. That's part of the penalty. Oh. 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 Stop it. Stop that. Oh, that's quite enough. <laughs> Seventeen inches, knee to ankle. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me do it. You hold her. No, 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 that's not fair. Yes, it is. No. You've lost to me, no, too. No, no, it's been done now. Now, now let me Come down. On. Hold her, Carl. No. <laughs> no, now stop it. No, no, no. No. Stand up. Gentlemen, if you please. It's only a game, Volfo. Uh, we meant no harm, upon my word. Come down off that table, please. Now. Thank you. We'll see you later. Now. Come on, Mozart. Don't be pompous. Leave us now, please. You realise what you've done? No. What? Just lost your reputation, that's all. You're now a loose girl. Oh, don't be so stupid. You are a married woman, for God's sake. And what of it? A young wife does not allow her legs to be handled in public. Couldn't you at least have measured your own ugly legs? What? Well, of course, they're not as fine as Eloisia's. My sister, I know, had perfect legs. We all know that. You know what you've done? You've shamed me. That's what you've done. Shamed me. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Shamed me in front of you. You shamed you. That's a laugh. If there's any shame around, lovey, it's mine. What do you mean? You've only had every pupil who's ever come to you. That's not true. Every single female pupil. Name them. Name them. Name them. The Arnhammer girl, the Rumbeck girl, Caterina Cavalieri, that Shh. sly little whore. Shh. She wasn't even your pupil, she was Salieri's. Which may be why he has so many and you have none. He doesn't drag them into bed. Of course he doesn't, he can't get it up. That's why. Oh. You heard his music? That's the sound of someone that can't get it up. At least I can do that. I'm sick of no you. No one ever said I couldn't do that. I don't give a fart. Oh, I hate you. I hate you forever and ever and ever and ever. Oh, God. I hate you. Oh, 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 Stanzi, don't cry. Please don't cry. I can't bear it when you cry. I just didn't want you to look cheap in people's eyes, that's all. Here. Beat me. Beat me. I'm your slave. Stanzi Marini. Stanzi Marini Bini Gini? I'll just stand here like a little lamb and bear your strokes. Here, do it. No. Bati, oh. bati, bati, mio tesoro. Plenty, wanty, piggly, poo. Stop it. Plenty, wanty had a fit. She her stays and made them split. Oh. When they took away her skirt, Stanzi, wanty, ate the dirt. Stop it now. Oh, oh, oh. Do it again. Do it again. I throw myself at your stinky feet, Madonna. Ah, 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 ah. ah. Good evening. Excellency. How long have you been there? I was asleep until a second ago. Are you two quarrelling? 
No, of course not. Uh, yes, we are. He's being very irritating. Carol, here tonight is time for New Year's resolutions. Irritating lovely ladies surely cannot be one of yours. May I suggest you bring us each a sorbetto from the dining room? Why don't we all go to the table? Uh, we... No, Herr Salieri is quite right. Bring them in here. It'll be your punishment. Fancy. Well, come now, I can keep your wife company. There cannot be a better peace offering than a sorbet of aniseed. I prefer tangerine. Very about tangerine, but if you could possibly manage aniseed for me, I'd be deeply grateful. So the new year can begin coolly for all three of us. <laughs> I'm honoured, signore, of course. And then I'll play you at billiards. What do you say? Oh, no, I'm afraid I don't play. You don't? Oh, Volfa would rather play billiards than anything. He's very good at it. I'm the best. I may not occasionally at composing, but at billiards, never. A virtuoso of the cue. Exactly. It's a virtuoso's game. I think I'll write a grand fantasia for billiard balls. Trillo, zaccacciatore, all arpeggios in ivory. <laughs> then I'll play it myself. In public? Okay, it had to be me. None of those Italian charlatans like Clementi would even be able to get his fingers round the queue. Ah! Scusate, signore. He's a love, really. And lucky, too, in you. You are, if I may say so, an astonishing creature. Me? Oh, ta, very much. On the other hand, your husband does not appear to be so thriving. We're desperate, sir. What? We've no money and no prospects of any, that's the truth. I don't understand. He gives many public concerts. They don't pay enough. What he needs is pupils, illustrious pupils. His father calls us spendthrifts, but that's unfair. I manage as well as anyone could. There's simply not enough. Don't tell him I talk to you, please. This is solely between us. How can I help? My husband needs security, so if only he could find regular employment, everything would be all right. Is there nothing at court? Not at the moment. The Princess Elizabeth needs a tutor. Really? I hadn't heard. A one word from you and the post would be his. Other pupils would follow at once. Well. Please, please, Excellency, you can't imagine what a difference it would make. But you can't speak of it now. Well, when then? Oh, please. Can you come and see me tomorrow? Alone. I can't do that. I'm a married man. All the same. When does he work? Afternoons. Then come at three. I can't, possibly. Yes or no? In his interests. So I'd done it, spoken aloud, invited her. What of my vow made in church? Fidelity, virtue, all of that. What did she think of me, this careful Italian, sincere friend, or hopeful seducer? Would she come? I had no idea. And if she did, how would I behave? I had no idea of that either. Next afternoon, I waited in fever. Was I actually going to seduce a young wife of two months standing? Part of me, much of me, wanted it badly. Badly. <laughs> yes, badly was the word. There she was. On the stroke, she'd come. She'd come. Signora. Excellency. Benvenuta. Uh, well, <laughs> you've come. I should not have done. My husband would be frantic if he knew he's a very jealous man. Are you a jealous woman? Why do you ask? It's not a passion, I understand. <laughs> You're looking even prettier than you were last night, if I may say so. Ta, very much. I brought you some manuscripts by Wolfgang. When you see them, you'll understand how right he is for a royal appointment. Would you look at them, please, while I wait? What do you mean, now? Yes, I have to take them back with me. You see, you'll miss them otherwise. He doesn't make copies. These are all originals. Sit down. Let me offer you something special. Oh, what's that? Capezzoli di Venere, nipples of Venus. Roman chestnuts in branded sugar. No, thank you. Oh, do try. They were made especially for you. Me? Yes, they're quite rare. Oh, well, then I'd better, hadn't I? Just one. Tell very much. Mm. Mm. Oh, oh. Mm. <laughs> oh, they're delish. <laughs> yes, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> Have another. Oh, I couldn't possibly. <laughs> mm. You know, I think you're the most G 
generous girl in the world. Generous? Mm, yes, it's my word for you. I thought last night Constanza's altogether too stiff a name for that girl. I shall rechristen her Generosa. La Generosa. And then I shall write a glorious song for her under that title, and she'll sing it just for me. Oh, I'm much out of practice, sir. La Generosa. <laughs> and tell me it's going to prove inaccurate, my name for you. What name do you give your wife, Excellency? I'm not an Excellency, and I call my wife Signora Salieri. If I named her anything else, it would be La Statua. She's a very upright lady. Is she here now? I should like to meet her. Alas, no. At this moment, she's visiting her mother in Verona. Uh, yeah, Constanza. Tomorrow evening, I dine with the Emperor. One word from me recommending your husband as tutor to the Princess Elizabeth and that invaluable post is his. Believe me, when I speak to His Majesty in matters musical, no one contradicts me. I believe you. Barely. <laughs> Surely such service deserves a little recompense in return. How little? Well, size of a kiss. Just one? If one seems fair to you. Does it? I fancy that's fairness enough. Pity. Somewhat small payment to secure a post every musician in Vienna is hoping for. What do you mean? Is it not clear? No, not at all. Another pity. <laughs> a thousand pities. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. What? What you've just said. I said nothing. What did, what did I say? Oh, I'm going. I'm getting out of this. No, Constanza. Let me pass, please. No, Constanza, listen to me. I'm a clumsy man. You think I'm sophisticated. I'm not at all. You take a true look. I've no cunning. I live on ink and, 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 and sweetmeats. I never see women at all. When I met you last night, I envied Mozart from the depths of my soul. Now, out of that envy came stupid thoughts. For one silly second, I dared imagine that out of the vast store you obviously possess, you might spare me one coin of tenderness your rich husband doesn't need and inspire me also. <laughs> I amused. <laughs> Mozart was right. You're wicked. He said that. All wops are performers. He said, be very careful with that one, meaning you. <laughs> he was being comic, of course. Oh, yes. But not that comic, actually. I mean, you are acting a pretty obvious role, aren't you, dear? A small town boy, and all the time as clever as cutlets. <laughs> oh. Are you sulking? Are you? When Mozart sulks, I smack his body. He rather likes it. Do you want me to scold you a bit and smack your body, too? How dare you? How dare you, you silly common girl? Forgive me. Let us confine our talk to your husband. He's a brilliant keyboard player, no question. However, the Princess Elizabeth also requires a tutor in vocal music, and I'm not convinced that he's the man for that. I'd like to look at the pieces you've brought and decide if he is mature enough. I will study them overnight, and you will study my proposal. Not to be vague, that is the price. Afternoon. Fiasco. Fiasco. The sordidness of it. The sheer sweating sordidness, worse than if I'd actually done it. To be that much in sin and feel so ridiculous as well. There was no excuse. If now my music was rejected by God forever, it was my fault, mine alone. Would she return tomorrow? Never. If she did, what then? What would I do? Apologize profoundly? Or try again. Nobile, nobile, Salieri. What had he done to me, this Mozart? Before he came, did I behave like this? Did I? 
toy with adultery, blackmail, women, twist myself into cruelties. It was all going, slipping, growing rotten because of him. said that these were the original scores, first and only drafts of the music. Yet they looked like fair copies, they showed no corrections of any kind. It was puzzling. And then, suddenly alarming. What was evident was that Mozart was simply transcribing music completely finished in his head. And finished, as most music is never finished. Displace one note, and there would be diminishment. Displace one phrase, and the structure would fall. Here again, only now in abundance, were the same sounds I'd heard in the library. The same crushed harmonies. glancing collisions. Agonizing delight. The truth was clear. That serenade was no accident. I was staring through the cage of those meticulous ink strokes An absolute beauty. Capisco. I know my fate. Now for the first time I feel my emptiness as Adam felt his nakedness. Tonight, at an inn, somewhere in the city stands a giggling child who can put on paper without actually setting down his billiard cue casual notes which turn my most considered ones into lifeless scratches. Grazie, signore. You gave me the desire to serve you, which most men do not have. Then saw to it that the service was shameful in the ears of the server. Grazie. You gave me the desire to praise you, which most men do not feel, then made me mute. Grazie tanti. You put into me perception of the incomparable, which most men never know, then ensured that I would know myself forever mediocre. Why? 
What is my fault? Until this day, I have pursued virtue with rigor. I have labored long hours to relieve my fellow man. I have worked and worked the talent you allowed me. You know how hard I've worked. Solely that in the end, in the practice of the art which alone makes life comprehensible to me, I might hear your voice. And now I do hear it. And it says only one name, Mozart. Spiteful, sniggering, conceited, infantine Mozart. Who's never worked one minute to help another man. Shit-talking Mozart and his body-smacking wife. Him you have chosen to be your sole conduct and my only reward. My sublime privilege is to be the one man alive in this time who shall clearly recognize your incarnation. Grazie e grazie ancora. So be it. From this time we are enemies. You and I. I'm not accepted from you, do you hear? They say God is not mocked. I tell you man is not mocked. I am not mocked. They say the spirit bloweth where it listeth. I tell you no, it must list to virtue. Or not blow at all. Dio in giusto. You are the enemy. I name thee now, Nemico Eterno. And this I swear, whilst I have breath, I shall block you on earth as far as I am able. What use after all is man? if not to teach God his lessons. Listen to the cats in the courtyard. They're all singing Rossini. It's obvious that cats have declined as badly as composers. Domenico Scarlatti owned one which actually stroll across the keyboard and pick out passable subjects for fugue. That was a Spanish cat of the Enlightenment. It appreciated counterpoint. Nowadays, all cats appreciate is coloratura, like everybody else. This is now the last hour of my life. You must understand me, not forgive. I do not seek forgiveness. I was a good man, as the world calls good. <laughs> what use was it to me? Goodness could not make me a good composer. Was Mozart good? Goodness is nothing in the furnace of art. On that dreadful night of the manuscripts, my life acquired a terrible and thrilling purpose, the blocking of God in one of his purest manifestations. I had the power. God needed Mozart to let himself into the world, and Mozart needed me to get him worldly advancement. It would be a battle to the end, and Mozart was the battleground. One thing I knew of him, God was a cunning enemy. Witness the fact that in blocking him in the world, I was also given the satisfaction of obstructing a disliked human rival. I wonder which of you will refuse that chance if it is offered. I felt the danger at once, soon as I'd uttered my challenge. How would he answer? Would he strike me dead for my impiety? Oh, don't laugh. I was not a sophisticate of the salons. I was a small town Catholic, full of dread. The first thing that happened 
Suddenly, Constanza was back. At ten o'clock at night. Signora. My husband is at a soiree of Baron van Schweten, a concert of Sebastian Bach. He didn't think I'd enjoy it. I see. Well, where do we go then? What? Do we do it in here? Why not? Come on, let's get on with it. Your manuscripts are there. <gasps> Please take them and go. What? Now, at once. You shit. Via, don't return. <gasps> you rotten shit. Via. You see how it was. I wanted her, oh yes, just then more than ever, but anything now would have been petty. My quarrel was not with Mozart, it was through him. Through him to God, who loved him so. Amadeus. Amadeus. The next day, when Caterina Cavalieri came for her lesson, I made the same halting speech about coins of tenderness, and I dubbed the girl La Generosa, I regret that my invention in love as in art was always limited. Fortunately, Katerina found it sufficient. She consumed twenty nipples of Venus, kissed me with branded breath, and slipped easily into my bed. She remained there as my mistress for many years behind my good wife's back, and I soon erased in sweat the sense of his little body, the creatures preceding me. So much for my vow of sexual virtue. The same evening I went to the palace and resigned from all my committees to help the lot of poor musicians. So much for my vow of social virtue. Then I went to the emperor and recommended a man of no talent whatever to instruct the Princess Elizabeth. Herr Sommer, a dull man, surely. What of Mozart? Majesty, I cannot with a clear conscience recommend Mozart to teach royalty. One hears too many stories. They may be just gossip. One of them, I regret, relates to a protege of my own, a very young singer. Charmant. Not pleasant, Majesty, but true. I see. Let it be Herr Sommer, then. I dare say he can't do much harm. To be frank, no one can do much harm musically to the Princess Elizabeth. Mozart certainly did not suspect me. The Emperor announced the appointment in his usual way. Well, there it is. And I commiserated with the loser. It's my own fault. My father was right. I should be more obedient. Know my place. He'll send me 16 lectures when he hears of this. It was a most serious loss, as far as Mozart was concerned. His list of pupils hardly moves. Six at most, and now a child to keep. A boy. Poor fellow. I, by contrast, prospered. That's extraordinary truth. If I'd expected anger from God, none came. None. Instead, incredibly, in 84 and 85, I came to be regarded as infinitely the superior composer. And this despite the fact that these were the two years in which Mozart wrote his best keyboard concerti and his string quartets. Haydn calls the quartets unsurpassed. They were, but no one heard them. Van Sweeten calls the concerti sublime. They were, but no one noticed. The Viennese greeted each unique concerto with the squeals of pleasure they usually reserved for a new style of bonnet. Each was played once by its composer, and then totally forgotten. I alone was empowered to recognize them fully for what they were, the most perfect things made by man in the whole of the 18th century. By contrast, my operas were played everywhere and saluted by everyone. I composed my Semiramide for Munich. Rapture.
rapturously received. People faint with pleasure. I wrote a comic opera for Vienna, La Grotta di Trofonio. The talk of the city. The cafes are buzzing. I finally finished my tragic opera, Danaeus, and produced it in Paris. Stupendous reception. Applauded, shook the roof. Your name sounds throughout the empire. Throughout all Europe. It was incomprehensible, almost as though I were being pushed deliberately from triumph to triumph. I filled my head with golden opinions, yes, and this house with golden furniture. My own taste was for plain things, but I denied it. I grew confident, I grew resplendent, I gave salons and soirees and worshipped the season round at the altar of sophistication. Mozart heard your comedy last night. He spoke of it to the Princess Lichnowsky. He said you should be made to clean up your own mess. Really? What charmers these Salzburgers are. <laughs> People are outraged by him. Oh, he empties drawing rooms. Now Van Schwieten is angry with him. Lord Fugue? I thought he was the Baron's little pet. <laughs> Mozart has asked leave to write an Italian opera. Italian opera threat my kingdom. And the Baron is scandalised. But why? What is the theme of it? Figaro! The marriage of Figaro, that disgraceful play of Beaumarchais. That's all he can find to waste his talent on, a vulgar farce. And when I reproved him, he said I reminded him of his father. Noblemen lusting after chambermaids, their wives dressing up in stupid disguises anyone could penetrate in a second. Why set such rubbish to music? Because I want to do a piece about real people, Baron, and I want to set it in a real place. A boudoir? because that, to me, is the most exciting place on earth. And the clothes on the floor, sheets still warm from a woman's body, even a piss pot brimming under the bed. Mozart! I want life, Baron, not boring legends. Herr uh, Salieri's recent Aeneas was a legend, and that did not bore the French. It's impossible to bore the French, <laughs> except with real life. I had assumed, now that you had joined our Brotherhood of Masons, you would choose more elevated themes. Elevated? <laughs> elevated? The only thing a man should elevate is his doodle. You are provoking, <laughs> sir. Has everything to be a joke with you? Excuse language, Baron, but really, how can we go on forever with these gods and heroes? Because they go on forever! That's why. They represent the eternal in us, Mozart. Opera is here to ennoble us. You and me, just as well as the Emperor. It is an aggrandizing art. It celebrates the eternal in man and ignores the ephemeral. The goddess in woman, and not the laundress. Well said, sir. Exactly. Uh, well said, yes. Well said, exactly. <laughs> I don't understand you. You're all up on perches, but it doesn't hide your assholes. Oh. Give a shit about gods and heroes. If you're honest, each one of you, which of you isn't more at home with this hairdresser than Hercules or, 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 or Horatius or your stupid Danaeus come to that? <laughs> or mine? Mine? Mitridate, king of Pontus. Idomineo, king of Crete. All those anguished antiques. They're all bores. Bores, 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 bores. All serious operas written this century are boring. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us. Four gaping mouths. What a perfect quartet. I'd love to write it. Just this second of time. This now. As you are. Herr Chamberlain thinking, Impertinent Mozart. I must speak to the Emperor at once. <laughs> Herr Prefect thinking, Ignorant Mozart debasing opera with his vulgarity. Herr Court composer thinking, German Mozart. What can he finally know about music? And Herr Mozart himself in the middle thinking, I'm just a good fellow. Why do they all disapprove of me? You see, that's why opera is important, Baron. Because it's realer than any play. A dramatic poet would have to put all those thoughts down one after another to represent this second of time. The composer can put them all down at once and still make us hear each one. Astonishing device, a vocal quartet. I tell you, I want to write a finale lasting half an hour. A quartet becoming a quintet, becoming a sextet. On and on, wider and wider. All sounds multiplying and rising together. And the together making a sound entirely new. I bet you that's how God hears the world.
Millions of sounds ascending at once and mixing in his ear to become an unending music, unimaginable to us. That's our job. That's our job, we composers, combining the inner minds of him and him and him and her and her, the thoughts of chambermaids and court composers, and turn the audience into God. <laughs> ah! Sorry! I talk nonsense all day. It's incurable. Ask Stanzel. My tongue is stupid, but my heart isn't. Oh, you're a good fellow under all your nonsense. I know that. He'll make a fine new brother Mason, won't he, Sayer? Better than I, Baron. Just try, my friend, to be more serious with your gifts. Buona fortuna, Mozart. Grazie, signore. Stop frowning, Herr Chamberlain. I'm a jackass. It's easy to be friends with a jackass. Just shake his hoof. <laughs> oh, tell the Emperor his opera's finished. Finished? Right here in my noodle. The rest's just scribbling. Goodbye. Good day to you. He's going to be proud of me. You'll see. That young man really is... Very lively. Intolerable. Intolerable. How could I stop it? How could I block this opera of Figaro? Incredible to hear. Within six weeks? Figaro is complete. The first performance will be on May the 1st. So soon? There's no way we can stop it. I have an idea. Una piccola idea. What? Mi ha detto che c'è un belletto nel terzo atto. Sì. What does he say? E dimmi, non è vero che l'imperatore ha proibito il balletto nelle sue opere? Un balletto? Ha! Precisamente. Che Fisco, ma che meraviglia! Perfetto, <laughs> veramente ingenioso. What is it? What is he suggesting? See him at the theatre. Of course, immediately. I'd forgotten you are brilliant court composer. I? I've said nothing. I must tell you that I resent this extremely. Mozart is right in some things. There's far too much Italian chittero chattero in this court. Now please to inform me at once. What was just said? <laughs> Patience, my dear Chamberlain. Patience. Just wait and see. Mozart! Mozart! Yes, Herr Director. A word with you, please. Right away. Certainly. What is it? I would like to see your score of Figaro. Oh, yes. Well... Just bring it here to me. Into my hand, please. Now, tell me, did you not know that His Majesty has expressly forbidden ballet in his operas? Ballet? Such as occurs in your third act. Oh, a ballet, Henry. That, that's a dance at Figaro's wedding. Exactly. A dance. Yeah, but the Emperor doesn't mean to prohibit dancing when it's part of the story. He made that law to prevent insertions of stupid ballet, like in French opera, and quite right, too. It is not for you, Herr Mozart, to interpret the Emperor's edicts, merely to obey them. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm taking out what should never have been put in. Now, sir, perhaps in future you will obey imperial commands. But if all that goes, there'll be a hole right at the climax of the story. Salieri! This is Salieri's idea! Don't be absurd. How did he think of that? Nothing I'd ever said could possibly make him think of that on his own. Had God given him the idea? It's a conspiracy! I can smell it! I can smell it! Control yourself. What do you expect me to do? The first performance is two days off! Rewrite it. That's your forte, is it not? Writing at speed. Not when the music's perfect. No, it is absolutely perfect as it is. I shall appeal to the Emperor. I'll go to it myself. I'll hold a rehearsal, especially for him. But the Emperor does not attend rehearsals. He'll attend this one, make no mistake. He'll come to this one, then he'll deal with you. This issue is simple. Write your act again today, or withdraw the opera. That's final. <laughs> you shit pot. Whoppy, foppy, wet arsed Italian loving shit pot. Come on, see the Roland cunt, Roland shit, Roland butter. You'll see the Emperor will come. You'll see. You'll see. Wolfgang. Wolfgang. I am forbidden.
forbidden. I... Yeah, but of course, you know already. Know what? No matter. Mozart, permit me. If you wish, I'll speak to the Emperor myself. Ask him to attend a rehearsal. You wouldn't. I can't promise that he will come, but I can try. Sir, I... Good day. Needless to say, I did nothing whatever in the matter, and yet, to my total stupefaction, in the middle of the last rehearsal of Figaro next day... Fakes and fireworks, fakes and fireworks, gentlemen. Good afternoon. Entirely against his usual practice, the Emperor appeared. I can't wait for this, Mozart, I assure you. Je prévois des merveilles. Majesty. Majesty. What did this mean? Was this proof that God had finally decided to defend Mozart against me? Was he engaging with me at last? I'm so grateful to you, I cannot express it. Hush, say nothing. One thing about the event seemed more than coincidence. <laughs> Very strangely, the Emperor had arrived at precisely the moment when the dancers would have begun had not they and their music been entirely cut. He and all of us watched the action proceed in total silence. I don't understand. Is it modern? No, Your Majesty. Then what? The Herr Director has removed a dance that would have occurred at this point. Why was this done? It's your own regulation, sir. No ballet in your opera. Not a ballet, uh, uh, Majesty. It's part, part of a wedding feast, entirely necessary to the story. Well, it certainly looks very odd the way it is. I can't say I like it. Not do I, Your Majesty. Do you like it, Rosenberg? It's not a question of liking, Majesty. Your own law decrees it. But yes, but all the same, this is nonsense. Look at them. They're like waxworks up there. Well, not exactly, Your Majesty. I don't like waxworks. Nor do I, Your Majesty. Well, who would? What do you say, Salieri? Italians are fond of waxworks, Majesty. <laughs> Our religion is largely based upon them. <laughs> you are cattivo again, court composer. <laughs> Your Majesty, Count Rosenberg is very worried that if this music is put back, it'll create the most unfortunate precedent. One will have thereafter to endure hours of dancing in opera. I think we can guard against that, you know, Chamberlain. I really think we can guard against hours of dancing. Uh, please restore Herr Mozart's music. Your Majesty, I must insist... You will oblige me, Rosenberg. I wish to hear Herr Mozart's music. Do you understand me? Yes, Majesty. Oh, God, I thank Your Majesty. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, yes, 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 yes. A little less enthusiasm, I beg you. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Well... There it is. And so Figaro was produced, in spite of all my efforts. I sat in my box and watched it happen. A conspicuous defeat for me, and yet I was strangely excited. <laughs> My march, <laughs> my poor march of welcome, now set to enchant the world forever. My dear Salieri. Herr Director? Almost in your style, that last bit. Uh, more vulgar, of course. Far more obvious than you would ever be. Exactly. <laughs> Trembling, I heard the second act. The restored third act. The astounding fourth. What shall I say to you who will one day hear this last act for yourselves? You will. Because whatever else shall pass away, this must remain. The scene was night in a summer garden.
pinprick stars gleam down on shaking summer houses. Plotters glided behind pasteboard hedges. I saw a woman dressed in her maid's clothes. Hear her husband utter the first tender words he'd offered her for years, <coughs> simply because he thinks she's someone else. Could one catch a realer moment and how, except in a net of pure artifice? The disguises of opera had been invented for Mozart. The final reconciliation. Melted sight. Through my tears, I saw the emperor yawn. Most ingenious Mozart, you're coming along nicely. I do think we ought to omit encores in future. It really makes things far too long. Make a note of it, Rosenberg. Majesty. Gentlemen, good night to you. Strack, attend me. Herr Salieri. Yes? What do you think? Do you think I'm coming along nicely? I think the piece is extraordinary. I think it is marvellous. Yes. I'll tell you what it is. It's the best opera yet written. That's what it is. And only I could have written it. No one else living. Rosenberg is furious. He'll never forgive Mozart. He'll do anything to get back at him. So it wasn't hard to get the piece cancelled. I saw to it, through the person of the furious director, that in the entire year, Figaro was played only nine times. My defeat turned, finally, into a victory. And God's response to my challenge remained as inscrutable as ever. Was he taking any notice of me at all? Withdrawn. Absolutely no plans for its revival. I commiserate with you, my friend. But if the public does not like one's work, one has to accept the fact gracefully and certainly they didn't it's too complicated too tiresome all those morbid harmonies and never a good bang at the end of a song so you know when to clap obviously I would not need to plot too hard against his operas in future the Viennese could be relied upon to destroy those for me I must concentrate on the man I decided to see him as much as possible to learn everything I could of his weaknesses I'll go to England. England loves music. That's the answer. We were yet again in the library of the Baroness Waldstaten. That room fated to be the scene of ghastly encounters between us. Again, too, the compensating crema al mascarpone. I was there when I was a boy. They absolutely adored me. I had more kisses than you've had cakes. When I was a child, people loved me. Perhaps they will again. Why don't you go to London and try? Because I have a wife and child and no money. I wrote to Papa to take the boy off my hands just for a few months so I could go, and he refused. In the end, everyone betrays you. Even the man you think loves you best. He's a bitter man, of course. After he'd finished showing me off around Europe, he never went anywhere himself. Just stayed up in Salzburg year after year, kissing the ring of the farts bishop and lecturing me. The real thing is, you see, he's jealous. Under everything, he's jealous of me. He'll never forgive me for being cleverer than he is. <laughs> I'll tell you a secret. Leopold Mozart is just a jealous, dried-up old turd, and I actually detest him. <laughs> Leopold Mozart. Leopold Mozart. Leopold Mozart is dead. Do not despair. Death is inevitable, my friend. How will I go now? What do you mean? In the world. There's no one else. No one else who understands the wickedness around. I can't see it. He watched for me all my life, and I betrayed him. No. I talked against him. No. I married where he begged me not. 
I left him all alone. I danced and played billiards and fooled around, and he sat by himself. Night after night in an empty house. No woman to care for him. Wolfgang. My dear Wolfgang, don't accuse yourself. Lean upon me, if you care to. Lean upon me. <coughs> so rose the ghost father in Don Giovanni. <laughs> A father more vengeful than any in opera. So rose the figure of the guilty libertine, casting himself into hell. I looked on astounded as from his ordinary life he made his art. We were both ordinary men, he and I. Yet from the ordinary he created legends, whilst I from legends created only the ordinary. Could I not have stopped my war? Shown him some pity? Oh yes, my friends, at any time. If he above had shown me one drop of it. Every day I set to work, I prayed, I still prayed, you understand. Make this one good in my ears. Just this one. One. But would he ever? I heard my music calmed in convention. Not one breath of spirit to lift it off the shallows. And I heard his. The spirit singing through it. Unstoppable in my ears. I heard his comedy of the seduction of two sisters. Così fan tutte. Thus do all women. Aloysia and Constanza immortalized. Two average girls turned into divinities. Their sounds of surrender sweeter than the psalms in heaven. Grant this to me. Grant this to me. No, 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 I do not need you, said the Abbey. I have Mozart better for you to be silent. The creature's dreadful giggle had become the laughter of God. I had to end it, but how? There was only one way. Starvation. Starve out God. Reduce the man to destitution. How do you fare today? Badly. I have no money and no prospects of any. It would not be too hard, surely. We must find him a post. One danger, the Emperor. There's nothing available, Majesty. There's chamber composer, now that Gluck is dead. Mozart. To follow Gluck. I won't have him say I drove him away. You know what a tongue he has. Then grant him Gluck's post, Majesty, but not his salary. Would be wrong. Gluck got 2,000 florins a year. What should Mozart get? 200. Light payment, yes, but for light duties. Perfectly fair. I'm obliged to you, court composer. Majesty. Easily done. Like many men obsessed with being thought generous, the Emperor Joseph was quintessentially stingy. Majesty, Herr Mozart, vous nous faites honneur. It's a damned insult. Not enough to keep a mouse in cheese for a week. Regarded as a token, Caro Herr. When I was young, they gave me snuff boxes. Now it's tokens, and for what? Pom, pom for fireworks, twang, twang for contra dances. I'm sorry it's made you angry. I'd not have suggested it if I'd known you'd be distressed. You suggested it? I regret I was not able to do more. Oh, forgive me. You're a good man, I see that now. You're a truly kind man, and I'm a monstrous fool. You... No, 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 please. You make me ashamed, you excellent man. No, 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 a civil play, a little less enthusiasm, I beg you. <laughs> 
Uh, Wolfgang, what is it? I get cramps sometimes in my stomach. I'm sorry. Excuse me. It's nothing, really. I will see you soon again. Of course. Why not visit me? I will. I promise. Bene. Bene. My friend. My new friend. Now, if ever, was the moment for God to crush me. I waited. And do you know what happened? I had just ruined Mozart's career at court. God rewarded me by granting me my dearest wish. Kapellmeister Bono. Kapellmeister Bono. Kapellmeister Bono is dead. You are appointed by royal decree to fill his place. First royal and imperial Kapellmeister to our court. Bravo! Bravo! Viva Salieri. Well done, Salieri. Dear Salieri, there it is. I was now truly alarmed. How long would I go unpunished? Mozart looks appalling. It must be galling, of course. I hear he's dosing himself constantly with medicine. For what? Envy, I imagine. I hear there's another child on the way. There is. I've seen the mother. I met him next in the Prata. Congratulations, sir. I thank you. And to you both. Your Excellency. Clearly there was a change for the worse. Eyes bulging more than ever. They gleamed oddly like a dog's when the light catches. I hear you are not well, my friend. I'm not. My pains stay with me. How wretched. What can they be? Also, I sleep badly. I have bad dreams. Bonfair. Dreams? Oh, it's the same one. A figure comes to me, cloaked in grey. Beckoning. It has no face. It's grey, like a mask. <laughs> what can it mean, do you think? Surely you do not believe in dreams. No, of course not. Not really. Surely you do not, madame. I never dream, sir. Things are unpleasant enough to me awake. It's all fancy, of course. If Wolfgang had proper work, he might dream less first, Kapellmeister. Fancy, please. Excuse us, sir. Come, darling. We are well enough, thank you. He's growing freakish. No question. Grey figures with no faces. He broods on his father too much, I fancy. Also, his circumstances make him anxious. They've moved house again. To the Rauenstein Gasse, number 970. They must be desperate. It's a real slum. Does he earn any money at all, apart from his post? Nothing whatever. I hear he's starting to beg. They say he's written letters to 20 brother masons. Really? And they're giving him money. Of course they would. I'd forgotten the Masons. Naturally, they would relieve him. How stupid of me. There could be no finally starving him with the Masons there to help. As long as he asked, they'd keep supplying his wants. How could I stop it? And quickly. Lord Fugue is most displeased with him. Is he? This is not good, brother. The lodge was not created for you to beg from. What else can I do? Give concerts as you used to do. I have no subscribers left, brother. I am no longer fashionable. I am not surprised. You write tasteless comedies which give offence. I warned you often enough. You did. I admit it. I will send you some fugues of Bach tomorrow. You can arrange those for my Sunday concert. You shall have a small fee. Thank you, Baron. I cannot live by arranging Bach! Generous fellow. All the same, I'll have to do it. If he were to turn the lodge against me, I'd be finished. My brother Mason's virtually keep me now. Never mind. I'll manage. You'll see. Things are looking up already. I've had a marvellous proposal from Schikaneder. He's a new member of this lodge. Schikaneder the actor? Yes, he owns a theatre in the suburbs. Well, more of a music hall, surely. Yes. He wants me to write him a vaudeville. Something for ordinary German people. Isn't that a wonderful idea? He's offered me half the receipts when we opened. Nothing in advance? He said he couldn't afford anything. I know it's not much of an offer, but a popular piece about brotherly love could celebrate everything we believe as Masons. It certainly could. Why don't you put the Masons into it? <laughs> into an opera? What? I couldn't. All the same, 
What an idea! Our rituals are secret, Wolfgang. I needn't copy them exactly. I could adapt them a little. Well, it certainly would be in a great cause. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Try it and see. Take courage, Wolfgang. It's a glorious idea. It is, isn't it? It really is. Of course, say nothing till it's done. Not a word. Secret. Secret. Good. And if that didn't finish him off with the Masons, nothing would. Mozart is delighted with himself. He's writing a secret opera and won't tell anyone its theme. It's really too tiresome. He told me, he told me everything. Initiation ceremonies, ceremonies with blindfolds, all rituals copied from the Masons. He sat at home, preparing his own destruction. A home where life grew daily more grim. Oh, I'm cold. Cold all day. Hardly surprising, since we have no firewood. Papa was right. We end exactly as he said we would. Beggars. It's all his fault. Papa's? He kept you a baby all your life. I don't understand. You always loved Papa. Did I? You adored him, you told me often. I hated him. What? He hated me. That's absurd. He loved us both very much. You're being extremely silly now. Am I? Yes, you are. Little wife of my heart. Do you remember the fire we had last night? Because it was so cold you couldn't even get the ink wet. You said, what a blaze. Remember, what a blaze. All those old papers going up. Well, my dear, those old papers were just all your father's letters, that's all. Every one he wrote since the day we married. What? Every one. All the letters about what a ninny I am, what a bad housekeeper I am. Every one. Stanzi! Shit on it. Sit on him! Oh, bitch! At least it kept us warm. What else will do that? Perhaps we should dance. You love to dance, Volfa. Let's dance, dance to keep warm. Write me a contradance, Mozart. It's your job to write dances, isn't it? And non fion dry, far far long, amoroso. Not di giorno, not di giorno, giorno. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stanzi, <laughs> Marini, Marini, Pini, don't. Please, 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 I beg you, look, 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 there's a kiss. Where's that come from? Right out of that corner. Look, here's another one. All wet and sloppy wet, coming right to you. Kiss, Get kiss, 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 off! Kiss, kiss. I'm frightened, Stans. Something awful's happened to me. I can't bear it. I can't bear much more of this. The figure's like this now. Here. Come here. Here. His face is still masked. Invisible. It becomes realer and realer to me. Stop it, for God's sake, stop! It's me who frightened me. You frightened me. If you go on like this, I'll leave you. Stop. I swear it. I mean it. I do. Oh! Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Come here to me, little wife of my heart. Come. Come, come. Who am I? Quick, tell me. Hold me and tell me who I am. Pussy, wussy. Who else? Meowy, powy. And you're squeaky, peaky. And stanzy, lanzy. And beany, jeeny. Wolfy, polfy. Poopy, peepy. <laughs> Now, don't be stupid. Come, come on, come on. Do it. Do it, let's do it. Poppy. Poppy. Papi. Papi. Papa. Papa. Papa, papa. Papa, papa. Papa, 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 papa. Papa, 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 papa. Papa, 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 Dancy, what is it? What is it? Oh! News! Suddenly! She's been delivered! Unexpectedly! Of a boy! Poor little Lim. To be born to that couple? In that room? With that money? And the father a baby himself? And now I hear... Now I hear... Something more has happened. Even stranger. 
She's gone. What do you mean? Danzel's gone away just for a while, she says. She's taken the baby and gone to Baden to the spa. It'll cost us the last money we have. But why? She's right to go. It's my fault. She thinks I'm mad. Surely not. Perhaps I am. I think I am. Yes. Wolfgang. Let me tell you. Last night I saw the figure again. The figure in my dreams. Only this time I was awake. It stood before my table. All in grey. Its face still grey. Still masked. And this time it spoke to me. Wolfgang Mozart. You must write now a requiem mass. Take up your pen and begin. A requiem? I asked, who is this requiem for? Who has died? It said, the work must be finished when you see me next. Then it turned and left the room. Oh, this is morbid fancy, my friend. It had the force of real things. To tell the truth, I do not know whether it happened in my head or out of it. No one understands he's gone. I frightened her away. Now she missed the vaudeville. You mean it's finished so soon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Music's easy. It's marriage that's hard. I long to see it. Would you come? Truly? Theatre isn't grand. It's just a popular music hall. No one from court will be there. Do you think that matters to me? I would travel anywhere for a work by you. I am no substitute for your little wife, but I know somebody who would be. Who? I'll tell you what. I'll bring Katerina. That'll cheer you up. Katerina? As I remember it, you quite enjoyed her company. <laughs> Signora. And so to the opera we went. A strange band of three. The first Kapellmeister, sleek as a cat, his mistress now fat and feathered like the great songbird she'd become, and Mozart, demented and drunk on the cheap wine which was now his constant habit. We went out into the suburbs to a crowded music hall in a slum. <laughs> you must be indulgent now. This is my first piece of this kind. We sat as he wished us to among ordinary Germans. The smell of sweat and sausage was almost annihilating. <laughs> this is so exciting. Do you think so? Oh, yes, this is exactly the audience we should be writing for, not the dreary court. As always, you show the way. As always, he did. My pungent neighbours rolled on their benches at the jokes. <laughs> and I, alone in their midst, heard the magic flute. He'd put the masons into it right enough, oh yes, but how? He'd turn them into an order of eternal priests. I heard voices calling out of ancient temples. I saw a vast sun rise on a timeless land where animals danced and children floated. And by its rays, all the poisons we feed each other drawn up and burned away. And in this sun, behold, I saw his father. No more an accusing figure, but forgiving. The highest priest of the order is hand extended to the world in love. Wolfgang feared Leopold no longer. A final legend had been made. Oh, the sound, the sound of that newfound peace in him, mocking my undiminishing pain. There was the magic flute there beside me. Mozart the flute and God the relentless player. How long could the creature stand it, so frail, so palpably mortal? And what was this I was tasting suddenly? Could it be pity? Never. Mozart! Baron! You hear how wonderful of you to come! 
I had, of course, suggested it. What have you done? Excellency? You have put our rituals into a vulgar show. No, sir. They are plain for all to see and to laugh at. You have betrayed the order. No. The Baron, a word with you. Don't speak for him, Salieri. You were ever a cruel vulgarian. We hoped to mend. Stupid, hopeless task. Now you are a betrayer as well. I shall never forgive you. And depend upon it. I shall ensure that no Freemason or person of distinction will do so in Vienna so long as I have life. Uh, Baron, please, I must speak. No, sir, leave alone. I did not look for this reward, Mozart. Never speak to me. Wolfgang. Wolfgang. All is not lost. But, of course, it was. Now he was ruined broken and shunned by all men of influence. And for good measure, he didn't even get his half receipts from the opera. Schikaneder pays him nothing. Schikaneder cheats him. Gives him enough for liquor. And keeps all the rest. I couldn't have managed it better myself. And then, silence. No word came from him at all. Why? I waited each day. Nothing. Why? What does he do? He sits at his window. All day and all night. Writing. Writing like a man possessed. Springs up every moment. Stares wildly at the street. Expecting something. Someone. We, we can't, can't imagine, imagine what. I could. Who did he look for? <gasps> a figure in grey. Masked and sorrowing, come to take him away. I knew what he was doing alone in that slum. He was writing his requiem mass for himself. Now I must confess the wickedest thing that I did to him. My friends, there is no blasphemy a man will not commit compelled to such a war as mine. I got me a cloak of grey. Yes. I got me a hat of grey. Yes. And a mask of grey. Yes. And appeared myself to the demented creature as the messenger of God. I confess that in November 1791, I, Antonio Salieri, then as now first royal Kapellmeister to the Empire, walked empty Vienna in the freezing moonlight for seven nights on end, that precisely as the clocks of the city struck one, I would halt beneath Mozart's window and become his more terrible clock. Every night I showed him one day less then stalked away. Every night the face he showed me at the glass was more crazed, finally, with no days left to him. Horror! I arrived as usual, halted, and instead of fingers, reached up beseechingly as the figure of his dreams. Come, come. Come. He stood swaying as if he would faint off into death, but suddenly, incredibly, he realized all his strength and called down to me the words out of his opera Don Giovanni, inviting the statue to supper. O statua gentilissima, venite a cena. For a long moment, one terrified man looked at another, and then, unbelievably, I found myself nodding, just as in the opera, starting to move across the street, pushing down the latch of his door, tramping up the stairs with stone feet. There was no stopping it, I was in his dream. It 
It's not finished. Not near me. Forgive me. Time was I could write a mass in a week. Give me one month more and it'll be done. I swear it. He'll grant me that, surely. God can't want it unfinished. Look, look, see what I've done. Here's the curie. That's finished. Take that to him. He'll see it's not unworthy. Curie is the first theme, Elaise on the second. Both together make a double fugue. If you do, I swear, I'll write a real piece of music. I know I've boasted I've written hundreds. It's not true. I've written nothing. Finally, good. Oh, it began so well, my life. Once the world was so full, so happy. All the journeys, all the carriages, all the rooms of smiles. Everyone smiled at me at once. The king at Schönbrunn, the princess at Versailles, they lit my way with candles to the clavier. My father bowing, bowing, bowing with such joy. Chevalier Mozart, my miraculous son. Why is it all gone? Why? Was I so bad? So wicked? Answer for him and tell me. Is it not good? It's good. Yes, it is good. I eat what God gives me, dose after dose for all of life, his poison. We are both poisoned, Amadeus. I with you, you with me. Echo me, Antonio Salieri. Ten years of my hate have poisoned you to death. Oh, God. God. God will not help you. God does not help. Oh, God. Oh, God. God does not love you, Amadeus. God does not love. He can only use. He cares nothing for who he uses, nothing for who he denies. You're no use to him anymore. You're too weak, too sick. He's finished with you. All you can do now is die. You'll find another instrument. He won't even remember you. <laughs> die. Amadeus, die. I beg you, die, die. Leave me alone, to implore. Oh, leave me alone at last. Leave me alone. Alone. Alone, 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 alone! Papa! 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 Take me, Papa. Put down your arms and I'll hop into them. Just as we used to do it. Hop, 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 hop. Hold me close to you, Papa. Let's sing our little kissy song together. Do you remember? Or hanya figata fa, marina gamina fa. Reduce the man. Reduce the god. Behold my vow fulfilled. The profoundest voice in the world, reduced to a nursery tune. Wolfie. Sansy! Oh, Wolfie, my love, my little husband of my heart. Oh, oh my dear one, go 
Come with me. Come on now. Come on. Come on. There, 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 there. Oh, Salieri. Salieri has killed me. Yes, my dear. Yes, you told yes, me yes, so. Yes, 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 I'm sure. He did! Hush now, lovey. He did! I'm back to take care of you. I'm sorry I went away. I'm here now for always. Salieri. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovey. Oh, be silent now. No one has hurt you. You'll get better soon, I promise. Can you hear me? Try to, Volfi. Volfi, Volfi, please. Listen, if, if I've been a bore, if I've nagged a bit about money, it didn't mean anything. It's only because I'm spoilt. You spoilt me, lovey. You've got to get well, Volfi, because we need you, Carl and baby Franz as well. There's only three of us, you know, lovey. We won't cost much. Just don't leave us. Don't leave us. We wouldn't know what to do without you. And you wouldn't know much either up in heaven without us, you soppy thing. You can't even cut up your own meat without help. I'm not clever, lovey. It can't have been easy living with a goose. But I've looked after you, you must admit that. And I've given you fun, too. Quite a lot, really. Are you listening? No one thing. It was the best day of my life when you married me. And as long as I'm alive, I'll be the most honored woman in the world. Can you hear me? The death certificate said kidney failure hastened by exposure to cold. Generous Lord Fugue paid for a pauper's funeral, 20 other corpses, an unmarked lime pit. What little I can spare you shall have for the children. There's no need to waste it on vain show. What did I feel? Relief? Of course I confess it. And pity too for the man I helped to destroy. I felt the pity God can never feel. I weakened God's flute to thinness. God blew, as he must without cease. The flute split in the mouth of his insatiable need. As for Constanza, in the fullness of time, she married again, a Danish diplomat as dull as a clock, and retired to Salzburg birthplace of the great composer, to become the final authority in all matters Mozartian. A sweeter-tongued man never lived. In ten years of blissful marriage, I never heard him utter a single coarse or cruel word. The purity of his life is reflected absolutely in the purity of his music. In selling his manuscripts, I charge by the ink so many notes so many shillings. That seems to me the simplest way. One amazing fact emerged. Mozart did not imagine that masked figure in grey who said, take up your pen and write a requiem. It was real. A certain bizarre nobleman called Count Walzeg had a longing to be thought a composer. He actually sent his steward in disguise to Mozart to commission the piece secretly so that he could pass it off as his own work. And this he even did. After Mozart's death, it was actually performed as Count Walzeg's Requiem, and I conducted it. Naturally, I did. In those days, I presided over all the great musical occasions in Vienna. I even conducted the salvos of cannon in Beethoven's dreadful battle symphony, an experience which made me almost as deaf as he was. And so I stayed on in the city of musicians, reverenced by all, on and on and on for 32 years. And slowly I understood the nature of God's punishment. What had I asked for in that church as a boy? Was it not fame? Well, now I had it. I was to become quite simply the most famous musician in Europe. I was to be bricked up in fame, buried in fame, embalmed in fame. But for work I knew to be worthless. This was my sentence. I must endure 
32 years of being called distinguished by people incapable of distinguishing. I must smell, as I wrote it, the deadness of my music, whilst their eyes brimmed with tears and their throats brayed with cheering. And finally, when my nose had been rubbed in fame to vomiting receptions, awards, civic medals and chains, suddenly his master stroke. Silence. It would all be taken away from me. Every scrap. Mozart's music would sound everywhere and mine in no place on earth. I must survive to see myself become extinct. When they trundled me out in a carriage to receive my last honour, a man on the curb said, Isn't that one of the generals from Waterloo? Nemi ko dei nemici dio implacabile. Dawn has come. I must release you. A moment's violence and it's over. You see, I can't accept this. To be sucked into oblivion, not even my name remembered. Oh, no. I didn't live on Earth to be his joke for eternity. <laughs> I've one trick left to me. See how he deals with this. All this week I've been shouting out about murder. You heard me yourselves. Do you remember Mozart, Pieta? Pardon your assassin, Mozart. I did it deliberately. My servants carried the news into the streets. The streets repeated it to one another. Now my name is on every tongue. Vienna, city of scandals, has a scandal worthy of it at last. Can it be true? Is it possible? Did he do it after all? Well, my friends, now they'll know for sure they'll learn of my dreadful death, and they'll believe the lie forever. After today, whenever men speak Mozart's name with love, they'll speak mine with loathing. As his name grows in the world, so will mine, if not in fame, then in infamy. I'm going to be immortal after all. And he is powerless to prevent it. <laughs> so, signore, See now if man is mocked. Amici cari. My razor is ready. I was created a pair of ears and nothing else. It's only through hearing music that I know that God exists, only through writing music that I could worship. All around me men hunger for general rights. I hunger only for particular notes. They seek liberty for mankind. I sought only slavery for myself to be owned, ordered, exhausted by an absolute. This was denied me, and with it all meaning. Now I go to become a ghost myself. I will stand in the shadows when you come here to this earth in your turns, and when you feel the dreadful bite of your failures, and you hear the taunting of unachievable, uncaring God, I'll whisper my name to you. Antonio Salieri, patron saint of mediocrities. And in the depth of your downcastness, you can pray to me. And I will forgive you. Vi saluto.
Beethoven's Conversation Book, November 1823. Visitors write the news for the deaf man. Salieri has cut his throat, but is still alive. Beethoven's Conversation Book, 1824. Visitors write the news for the deaf man. Salieri is quite deranged. He keeps claiming that he is guilty of Mozart's death and made away with him by poison. The German Musical Times, May 25th, 1825. Our worthy Salieri just cannot die. In the frenzy of his imagination, he's even said to accuse himself of complicity in Mozart's early death. A rambling of the mind believed in truth by no one but the deluded old man himself. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. No, no one, one believes, believes it. In, in the, the world. world. Mediocrities everywhere, now and to come. I absolve you all. Amen. In Amadeus by Peter Schaffer, Salieri was played by Paul Schofield and Mozart by Simon Callow. Constanza Mozart was played by Felicity Kendall, Joseph II by John Normington, Baron von Swieten by Nicholas Selby and Count Rosenberg by Willoughby Goddard. Johann von Strack was played by Nicky Henson, The Venticelli by Donald G. and Dermot Crowley, and other parts by Nigel Belairs, Susan Gilmore, Peggy Marshall, Robin Meredith, Anne Sedgwick, William Slay and Glenn Williams. Amadeus was directed by Peter Hall and produced by David Spencer. The production was first broadcast in 1983.